Hello, and welcome to Why Do Countries Exist, Episode 2, Afghanistan. So, if you don't count Abkhazia, this is our first real country. Afghanistan is really only known in America as a country that we've been fighting in for the last 20 years, with no real end in sight. However, there is much more to Afghanistan's history. It has been called the Graveyard of Empires, and ironically enough with that name, many empires have passed through and subjugated the country throughout its long history. It's a history filled with misconceptions that hopefully may be cleared up a little bit. Afghanistan is located at a crossroads between regions. It has the Middle East to the west, South Asia to the south, and Central Asia to the north, and debatably could be considered in any of these three. It is bordered by the countries of Iran, Pakistan, China, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and Turkmenistan. Each of these countries and regions holds a little bit of influence in Afghanistan, affecting its politics and people. It is mostly mountainous, making it difficult to traverse, but also beautiful, and was noted in the 60s for being one of the most pretty and safest countries to backpack through. It's also important to note that Afghanistan is the first stan country we're going to talk about, so I suppose I'll mention what stan means. Stan means place of in Persian, so Afghanistan means place of Afghans, although being Afghan doesn't correspond to any ethnic group today. Afghanistan is a country of diversity. No ethnic group holds a majority of the population, with there being over seven major ethnic groups that inhabit the country. The largest of these is the Pashtuns. The Pashtuns make up somewhere between 35 to 45 percent of the population, and are mainly based around the border with Pakistan in the east, with roughly half of the ethnic group divided between the two states. They are an Iranian people, speak Pashto, and mainly practice Sunni Islam. The Pashtuns have played an important role in Afghan history, as they have often led the country. Many of the first Afghan kingdoms were headed by Pashtun kings, and being Afghan was previously connected to being Pashtun. The next largest ethnic group are the Tajiks. The Tajiks are Persian-speaking people who mainly practice Sunni Islam, although a significant minority practice Shia Islam, and are mainly based around the border with the country of Tajikistan in the northeast. Interestingly enough, it is believed there are more Tajiks in Afghanistan than there are in Tajikistan itself. They are believed to make up around 20 to 35 percent of the population. After that, we have the Hazra, another Persian-speaking people who are based in the middle of the country and mostly practice Shia Islam. They make up between 7 to 20 percent of the population. After that, we have the Uzbek, the largest Turkic people in Afghanistan. They are based around the border with Uzbekistan in the north, speak Uzbek, are mainly Sunni Muslim, and make up between 7 to 10 percent of the country. Then there are the Imak people, who are a Persian-speaking semi-nomadic people in the west and northwest, who make up 1 to 4 percent of the population. Next, there are the Turkmen, who are based around the border of Turkmenistan in the northwest, speak Turkmen, a Turkish language, practice Sunni Islam, and make up 1 to 3 percent of the population. Then there are the Baluch, who are based around a region known as Baluchistan in the south. Most Baluch are based in Iran and Pakistan, and in recent years have had to deal with a separatist insurgency. Now, there are also the Nuristani, the Mughal, the Pashai, the Pamir, the Kyrgyz, the Arabs, Gujar, and many other smaller groups in the country. But I'm sure you're thinking, holy shit, why is all this information important? Mainly, I just want you to know that there's a lot going on ethnically in the country. I would actually encourage you just to look at an ethnic map of the country to get a better idea of how many groups there are, the locations of these groups, and their relationships to the major cities. But the main thing I want you to remember is that there's a lot of groups, and if you're paying close attention, you may have noticed that a lot of these groups are mainly Sunni Muslim, with roughly 80% of the country being Sunni, and the remainder mostly being Shia. And a lot of them speak Persian, mainly the Dari dialect, which is understood by 70-80% to 80 of the country, and serves often as a lingua franca. So now that we have gotten the complicated demographics out of the way, we have to start figuring out where to start off the long history of Afghanistan. The the region has been inhabited for many thousands of years, with many empires springing forth from within Afghanistan's borders. Kabul, the capital of the country, is believed to have been inhabited for over 3,000 years, and while I could spend all day talking about each and every empire to enter the region, I'm sure we don't have all day, so I'll quickly speed run through the history up until the 1700s. Afghanistan was held by many early Persian kingdoms, starting with the Medes. Zoroastrianism was brought into the region, where it coexisted with many other religions, such as Buddhism, Hinduism, Animalism, and after Alexander the Great invaded in 1323 BCE, Greek polytheism. The Greeks would help establish kingdoms in the region, such as the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom and the Indo-Greek Kingdom, which would last until the early CE era. Islam would be brought into the region during the 600s, and would become dominant in the region in the 900s after the rise of several medieval Persian states. These Persian states would have a significant influence in the region, bringing Persian languages and culture into the region. The Persians would hold cultural and political control of the region until the 1200s, when the Persian Empire of Khwarezmian was destroyed by the Mongols. The Mongols and their successors the Ilkhanate and later Tamerlane's Empire 
would control the area, massacring any that resisted. They brought with them both Mongolic and Turkic culture and influence. By the late 17th century, Afghanistan was divided between the new Persian Safavid Empire, the Indian-based Mughal Empire, and the Uzbeks from Bukhara in the north, with it acting as a frontier region for all three empires. The first Afghan state would emerge in the early 18th century. By this time, the Shia Muslim Safavid Empire had begun attempting to Shiify the region, and encouraged the Pashtuns to convert to Shia Islam to make it more supportive of their rule. This created unrest, and by 1709, a Pashtun chief, Mirawas Hotek, rebelled and established the first Pashtun-led empire that controlled Afghanistan along with much of western Pakistan. The Hoteks would reach their peak in the 1720s when under Muhammad Hotek they managed to completely take over Safavid land not only in Afghanistan but also in Iran, taking the city of Ishavan and crowning themselves the Shahs of Iran. This wouldn't last long, however, as in 1729, the new Afghan ruler, Ishavan Hotek, was defeated by the Persian general Nader Shah in the Battle of Damgan. This would force the Hoteks back to Afghanistan proper, and in 1739 would be defeated after Nader Shah, now Shah of Iran, took the Hotek capital of Kandahar. Nader Shah proved to be an effective military commander, taking control of most of the Safavids' previous land, and even invading as far as Delhi in India. However, he proved to be a cruel Shah, and was assassinated in 1747 after 15 men attempted to kill him in his sleep. On a side note, he also managed to kill two of them before they could finish him off. This sent the new Persian kingdom into chaos. A former Pashtun commander in Nader Shah's army, Ahmed Shah Durrani, quickly took advantage of the situation, and leading a group of men from Nader Shah's army was proclaimed Amir of the Afghans and took Kandahar, where he established the phase of power. He then took almost all of modern-day Afghanistan, northeastern Iran, southern Turkmenistan, and Tajikistan before moving east to take almost all of modern-day Pakistan, the Punjabi region of India, and sack the city of Delhi. The empire reached its peak in 1761, and even though the Afghans would be rolled back by several Sikh invasions from India, they managed to maintain control over most of Afghanistan and started the process of nation building. Even today, Ahmad Durrani is considered the father of the nation for his work building up the Durrani Empire. After Ahmad Durrani's death in 1772, the Durrani Empire would be plunged into civil war as several different Durrani princes fought for the throne. Often they would rule for several years before either dying or being forced out of office. The Durrani Empire also suffered from the end of the Silk Road trade as most trade was now done on the water, leaving landlocked Afghanistan out of the picture. This cycle of weakness would end in 1826, when the empire was overthrown by another Pashtun leader, Dost Muhammad Khan. He would establish the Emirate of Afghanistan and created the Bar Khazai dynasty, which would rule Afghanistan until the 1970s. Dost Muhammad Khan would quickly find himself fighting both Qajar Persia to the west, the Sikh Empire to the east, revolts from the inside, and soon European political games. The 19th century was filled with colonial expansion across the world, and in Asia it was no different. The Russians had been moving into Central Asia since the 1920s to secure its southern border and gain resources in the region. The British, meanwhile, had been moving into South Asia since the 17th century, eventually taking almost all of the Indian subcontinent. Both superpowers sought to increase their prestige in the region and were paranoid of an invasion from one another, and so quickly sought to secure a border between the two of them. Since Afghanistan sits at the crossroads between Central and South Asia, it quickly became the focal point in what is now known as the Great Game. In 1839, the British decided to try and gain control of Afghanistan. They wanted to remove Dost Muhammad Khan from the throne and replace him with the former emir Shah Shuja Durrani, who would rule Afghanistan as the puppet state for the British. While at first they managed to enter couple and set Shah Shuja up as a puppet, they were quickly hated by the locals. Many joined the guerrilla insurgency of Dost Muhammad Khan in the countryside. In early 1842, the 4,500 British and Indian troops, along with their camp followers and families, which made up another 14,000 people, left Kabul after the Afghan population in the city turned incredibly hostile. They were quickly massacred by the Afghans on their way to retreat back into British-held Pakistan, with many either being killed, captured, or sold into slavery. It is believed only one European and an unclear number of Indian soldiers managed to survive the massacre and return to British-held territory. The British launched another expedition to siege Kabul later in the year, and while they were successful in damaging the city, the First Anglo-Afghan War was seen as a major defeat for the British. However, British attempts to take control of the region wouldn't stop in 1842. In 1879, after the Emir Shir Ali Khan began to grow closer to the Russians, the British decided to invade. They managed to take Kabul quickly and sign the Treaty of Gandamuk in 1879. The treaty didn't end the Second Anglo-Afghan War, however, as soon after the British consulate in Kabul was massacred. The British then sent another expeditionary force into the country. They managed to cross most Afghan forces sent against them and installed Abdur Rahman Khan as the new Emir. The Afghans were, however, victorious in the Battle of Maiwand in 1880, which quickly became an important symbol of Afghan resistance against foreign powers. However, the battle held more symbolic than strategic importance as the Afghans would lose the Battle of Kandahar two months later, bringing an end to the war. The Treaty of Gandamuk would quickly set up what would become the state of affairs in Afghanistan for the next 40 years. The British forces would leave the region. 
However, Afghanistan will be forced to give over some of its land in what is now Pakistan to the British and set up the infamous Durand Line. This line would establish the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. It would separate the Pashtun and Baluch communities who now found themselves living in separate countries despite still maintaining a close cultural connections and broad political goals. Britain would effectively rule Afghan foreign policy, but would have little say in choosing political leaders, and Afghanistan's emir would still hold the majority of power in the country. During these 40 years of relative peace from European powers, Afghanistan would slowly begin the process of modernization in the army and consolidated power within the country. During World War I, the Germans would attempt to get Afghanistan to join them, but found little success. However, after the war, Afghans, angered by European powers' refusal to let them participate in the Treaty of Versailles and the assassination of the Emir, attacked British forces in Pakistan, starting the Third Anglo-Afghan War. While the Afghans were militarily unsuccessful, it did force the British to the negotiating table, and Afghanistan was given full independence. With this new independence, the Emir and Muala Khan increased modernization and sought more radical social change. This would lead to increased tensions and eventually resulted in revolts in 1929 among the more traditionalist parts of the country and in the Tajik majority regions. The Tajiks and their allies managed to take control of the government for almost a year before Muhammad Nader Shah managed to retake Kabul and proclaimed himself king of the Afghans in 1929 and installed the new house Mushahabin. The Mushahabins would work to increase the development of Afghanistan by both attempting to respect tribal and social norms while also building roads, infrastructure, and universities. The Mushahabans would be overthrown in 1973 in a coup d'etat. The Republic of Afghanistan was proclaimed with coup leader and cousin of the king, Muhammad Dayyub Khan, as the first president. He led an authoritarian one-party state with a national revolutionary party continuing the modernization of Afghanistan. However, opposition groups still remained active in the country and would often join either communist or Islamist-aligned organizations which concentrated in Afghanistan's newly created universities. In 1978, Dayud Khan was overthrown in the Saar Revolution, with the communists taking power and quickly aligning themselves with the Soviets. These communists organized themselves around the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, or the PDPA, and aligned themselves with the Soviet Union. They also continued to modernize the country and even worked towards greater rights for women and workers in the country. But they also sought to curb the influence tribal and religious leaders had in Afghan life, often by using forced disappearances and torture. This led the Islamist party still active in the country to become more radicalized and gain a membership. The PDPA itself became divided between those that wanted a more pragmatic and slow approach, the Parchem, and those that wanted a more broad and radical changes, the Khalik. In 1779, the Soviet troops allied with the Parchem faction came in and killed the pro khalik president. Opposition groups quickly took to the mountains and countryside. The start of 50 years of war in Afghanistan had begun. Now the fight between what is now known as the Mujahideen and the communist-backed Soviet government is probably one of the most famous periods of Afghan history yet often misunderstood. Mujahideen is a catch-all term for those Afghans that fought against the Soviets. There was no central command uniting all the Mujahideen together, and many hated each other just as much as the Soviets. The Mujahideen can be divided into several different groups. First are the Maoists, who were communists just like the government, but favored Maoist ideas on governance and revolution. Other secularist groups included a small number of nationalists who opposed the Soviets and later Western foreign powers interfering in the country. These secularist groups would remain relatively small throughout the conflict. Then there are the Shia Muslim Mujahideen, they primarily came from the Hazra community, and eight of some of the largest Shia political parties would form an alliance known as the Tehran Eight to fight the Soviets and other Mujahideen factions. The last groups are the Sunni Muslim Mujahideen, which came from a variety of ethnic groups, but mainly the Pashtuns, Tajiks, and Uzbeks. Six Pashtun and one Tajik political party formed the Penchwar Seven, creating the largest anti-Soviet bloc in the country. Within these groups, tension remained high as rival political, ethnic, and religious groups fought each other for control of territory and resources. The United States infamously helped out several Mujahideen groups in the hope of both weakening the Soviet Union and the new communist government, along with protecting its new ally Pakistan. Pakistan had grown close to the U.S. after its independence in the 40s. The U.S. gave roughly $3 billion in funds to Pakistan. Pakistan then distributed that money to the Mujahideen groups that they liked. America also helped by sending CIA advisors to help train Afghans. Mujahideen could also train and hide out in Pakistani territory where they could establish a base of operations. Pakistan had more than just loyalty to the U.S. in aiding the Mujahideen forces, however. The Duran line still proved to be a controversial issue, and Pakistan didn't want a powerful Afghan government to threaten its borders, hoping to use Sunni Mujahideen groups to destabilize Afghanistan. Pakistan also supported the Mujahideen as a way of revenge for the Soviets siding previously with India in geopolitical disputes and along with several other Islamic countries, Egypt and Saudi Arabia being the largest, to protect what many of them saw as an authoritarian and atheist government oppressing and trying to stamp out Islam. Many Muslims from around the world sought to raise funds and provide medical or technical assistance to the Mujahideen in the fight against the communists. A small number of these foreigners would actually participate in the fighting, becoming what is now known as the Afghan Arabs, with the most famous member of the Afghan Arabs being the future terrorist Osama bin Laden. Iran funded Shia Mujahideen groups to both protect their fellow Shia brethren and in an effort to spread the new radical Khomeiniist ideology that had taken control in their country. Finally, China also supported the Mujahideen to weaken the Soviets who they had recently had a falling out with, training many fighters in Chinese territory. The Afghan communists still held support in the country, despite the odds. 
While much of the countryside remained in the hands of the various Mujahideen factions, most of the urban centers remained firmly in communist control. The Soviets went all out in ensuring that these cities remained into the central government's control, with more than half a million men being sent into the country in total throughout the war. The Soviets used tanks, helicopters, and landmines to try and both defeat the Mujahideen militarily and break the morale of the Afghans. While the Soviets won most of the major pitch battles in the war, they suffered heavy casualties and seemed unable to break the insurgency. By 1988, with the decline of the Soviet Union and efforts of Soviet leadership to open up the USSR, the Soviets began leaving and would fully be gone by 1989. The communist government would continue the fight until 1992 with the fall of Kabul to the Mujahideen. Now with the communists gone, the Mujahideen attempted to form a government and founded the Islamic State of Afghanistan, an Islamist but also democratic transitional government headed by Burahuddin Rubani and militarily with Ahmad Shah Mossoud leading a coalition of Afghan militias. Mossoud was a Tajik member of jamet e islami one of the original Islamist organizations formed to fight Dayud Khan's government. The party was made up of mainly Tajiks and came to represent the moderate Islamist faction of the Sunni Mujahideen. Under Massoud, they proved to be highly effective driving the communists out of the north of the country, setting up a quasi-state and proved to be one of the strongest forces in the Peshawar 7. Massoud, however, found himself facing off against the fellow Peshawar 7 organization, Hezbi Islami, under the leadership of Gulbuddani Hekmartyar. Hekmartyar, a Pashtun, was also one of the original Islamists fighting Dayoz Khan's government. However, he came from a far more radical and militant stream of Islamism, and Hekmartyar and Massoud's forces were fighting each other well before the communists fell. So from the start, the Islamic State of Afghanistan had to deal with Mujahideen factions fighting each other. Hekmartyar's forces attempted to take Kabul starting in 1992, and after struggling to take the city, resorted to bombing the hell out of it. Other Mujahideen groups fought for Kabul, including the Hazra-led Hazbi-i-Wahhabit Islami, and the Uzbek-led Junvish i Mili Islami, led by future Vice President of Afghanistan, Abdullah Rashid Dastum, and several other rival groups. Even though the government maintained control of Kabul, fighting was intense. Most of the destruction that took place in Kabul actually happened at this time. Numerous massacres were committed and much of Kabul descended into ethnic violence. Then, in 1994, the most famous militant group in Afghanistan arrived the Taliban, or in Pashto, the students. Now, unlike the rest of the groups I have mentioned, the Taliban were not active during the war against the communists, and most of the original members actually lived outside the country. During the war with the communists, many families, and especially orphan children, fled to Pakistan. While there, these kids would grow up in Sunni religious schools, often connected with radical Islamist organizations. As they grew up, they came to believe in a strict authoritarian version of Islamism. In 1994, a group of these now grown-up Islamists took the city of Kandahar under the leadership of Muhammad Omar. Omar, while he had not grown up with these refugees, and actually fought against the communists during the 80s, shared their views and quickly formed the Taliban. The Taliban found support among the Pakistani intelligence community, who had previously backed Hekmartyar and international Islamist organizations. They also found support among most Afghans, who simply wanted an end to the violence and hoped that the Taliban would bring about a state of normalcy. By 1996, they had taken Kabul and forced Massoud's coalition of moderates to the north, along with Hekmartyar, who fled to Iran, while most of his forces would join the Taliban. The Taliban, now controlling most of the country, sought to implement radical Islamist policies in the country, and form the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. While at first they were loved by large segments of the population for executing rapists and former communists, destroying the drug trade in the country, and most importantly, bringing law and order to most of the areas under their control, public opinion quickly turned sour. Women weren't allowed to go outside the home if not covered up, and couldn't go to school. Music, TV, movies, and even photography itself was all banned. Criminals were often punished with capital punishment, such as whippings and amputations. Pre-Islamic historical sites were destroyed, and Pashto-speaking Pashtuns dominated the government, even though most of the country spoke Dari Persian. The Taliban under Omar also began offering other radical Islamist organizations camps in Afghanistan where they could train fighters or use it as a hideaway. Al-Qaeda, now led by bin Laden, began working closely with the Taliban in the region. The Taliban had about order, but not peace. Opposition to the regime was kept up by those who had fled north, who began calling themselves the Northern Alliance. While they did suffer with numerous massacres by Taliban troops, they managed to hold on and build a relatively stable administrative system in the north. By 2001, the Northern Alliance had made contacts with leaders from almost every ethnic group in Afghanistan, and it was believed soon they would launch an offensive to retake the country. While several Central Asian states and Iran had supported the Northern Alliance with funds and weapons, they began reaching out to Western powers for assistance in defeating the Taliban. On April 6, Massoud traveled to the European Parliament asking for assistance and prophetically warning of a potential terrorist attack that could be launched against the West. Massoud, however, was killed on September 9, 2001 by Taliban agents posing as journalists. The terrorist attacks of September 11 changed Afghan history immediately. While previously, Western powers had for the most part left Afghanistan alone after the fall of the Soviet Union, they now focused all their resources on capturing bin Laden. After Taliban leaders refused to give bin Laden to the Americans, American forces began the invasion of Afghanistan. NATO troops and Northern Alliance militias quickly took control of most of the country, and by the end of 2001, all major cities were under Northern Alliance-American control, and the Taliban leadership had fled the country. 
However, Bin Laden and many of the Taliban had escaped to Pakistan, where they could regroup. The Northern Alliance got to work trying to rebuild the country, with Hamid Karzai becoming the president in 2001, and the new Islamic Republic of Afghanistan being formed. However, the road to rebuilding has proved challenging. The Afghan government today is noted for being incredibly corrupt and plagued with both political and ethnic infighting. Even right now, the current presidency is disputed between Afsharif Karani, who has been president since 2014, and Abdullah Abdullah, who has been the chief executive officer of Afghanistan, with both men claiming they won the presidential election in 2019 and setting up their own administration. It should be noted that the chief executive officer was created as a compromise for Abdullah after the 2014 presidential election, after Abdullah and Karani claimed to have both won that election as well. The Taliban, having lost control of the country, have started engaging in guerrilla warfare against the new administration. Most of the fight against the Taliban has been led by the Americans, who set up the International Security Assistance Force, which was a military mission led by NATO nations in both fighting the Taliban and training the Afghan army. However, the Afghan army has been noted for being very ineffective, with some estimates showing that one-fourth of all Afghan troops will desert before their time in the army is up. Along with this lack of discipline, high drug use and a high rate of infiltration of Taliban and Islamist Asians have plagued the military. Starting in 2011, under political pressure back home, NATO troops started the process of leaving the country and handing over responsibilities to Afghan troops. However, foreign troops still remain in the country under the new NATO mission Operation Resolute Support, but under reduced numbers. Since the start of this new NATO mission in 2014, the Taliban have increased their number and intensity of attacks across the country. This has also corresponded with the rise of ISIS in the region, although they have remained small and have been in conflict with the Taliban. The American presence in the country has caused considerable controversy both in America and Afghanistan, especially in relation to civilian casualties caused by American and Afghan government troops and what some consider to be America's quasi-colonial presence in the country. While I'm not going to go too deep into either topic, what is important to note is civilian casualties are common. It is believed that almost 31,000 civilians have died since 2001, and in total, one of two million Afghans have died between now and 1979 when the conflict in the region began. What most Afghans seem to want more than anything is an end to the war in the region and a return to stability. In recent years, there have been increasing peace talks between the Taliban and the government. However, it seems every peace talk ends with one side claiming the other has just broken the agreement and violence returning. The latest peace agreement to be broken was just this Tuesday, May 12, 2020. On a side note, one major Islamist group operating in the region that has agreed to a ceasefire is Akhmartyar's militia, Hezbi Islami, with Akhmartyar actually being a candidate in the 2019 election, winning 3% of the vote. While most foreign states have come to support the government, a few remain skeptical. While officially no state outright supports the Taliban, several states such as Russia, Iran, Qatar, and China have all been accused of aiding the Taliban. One state stands out in supporting them, however, and that is Pakistan. Pakistan has constantly been accused of arming and aiding the Taliban, which has led to considerable tension between them and the Afghan government. Many believe Pakistan sides with the Taliban mainly to have influence in the country and to prevent a strong Afghan government from pressing the issue on the Durand line. Pakistan fears an Afghanistan united could begin challenging Pakistan's borders. We can see this in the Pakistani region of Balochistan, where the Pakistani government has accused the Afghan government of aiding Baluchi separatists who have military bases in Afghanistan. Both governments use each other's ethnic groups to create trouble, challenge the other's borders, and try and maintain control. So why does Afghanistan exist? Afghanistan is a country that is influenced by everyone else and yet still wants to be fiercely independent. Afghanistan's terrain is mostly mountainous, making it difficult for invading armies to cross over. Yet many empires have held Afghanistan at some point. It has incredible ethnic diversity, and yet many people in the region are able to connect to each other through culture, language, or religion. It's very difficult to summarize Afghan history. It seems like they're always in the middle of a greater game by geopolitical powers. While the war in Afghanistan doesn't appear like it will end soon, it does appear the country of Afghanistan itself will remain in the crossroads of Asia. Next week, we will move west into Albania. Its location in the Balkans has made it the subject of many different empires and peoples, while also retaining its national identity. The strong sense of national identity has caused controversy with its neighbors, with Albanians often forming large minorities in almost all the neighboring states. Prepare for butchered Albanian names and ethnic controversy next week. Thank you for listening. My email is whydocountriesexist at gmail.com. The sources I use for this paper are the Afghanistan Analysis Networks paper, Islamist Leftist and the Void in the Center, Afghanistan's Political Parties and Where They Came From, the two-part BBC documentary, The Great Game, Caspian Report's video, Origins of the Taliban, Epimetheus's videos, History of Afghanistan Summarized, and Is Afghanistan the Graveyard of Empires, Feature History's video, Soviet Afghan War, French 24 documentary, The Lion of Panjshir, Geography Now's video, Afghanistan, The Great War's video, The Graveyard of Empire Strikes Back, The British Afghan War of 1919, The Tolo News article, Baluchi Separatist Leader Killed in Kandahar Attack, and Wikipedia.